you know, very simply, and I've seen this in my own life, what I would say is, you know, for, for trips that are shorter than, start easy, right? Shorter than three miles, five kilometers. Think about uh, doing that on a bike instead of in a car um, and see how it feels. See how, you know, do you enjoy it more? Is it faster? Are you getting a bit of a workout? You know, like like tonight, for example, I, you know, my, my commute to work is about 10 kilometers, um, but it's a great way to get a workout in without have, actually having to s separately set out time to do a workout. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman and that is Josh Hahn with Turn Bikes, uh, one of my favorite bike brands just because they are so awesome. They're comfortable, easy to use, and uh, I just love my GSD. So it's an absolute honor to connect with Josh and talk bikes uh, with him and the potential that uh, electric assist and cargo carrying capacity can have on our society. Uh, it's a good one. So let's get right to it with Josh Hahn. Josh, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks, John. Uh, hey, Josh, I, I love to have my guests just uh, give a quick, you know, 30 second introduction to themselves. Uh, so who is Josh Hahn? Um, well, uh, born in L.A., uh, grew up in L.A., uh, went to school and lived up in the Bay Area uh, for a while. And then at the age of 25, moved over to Taiwan to help parents with a bike business. And uh, so now I've spent, you know, more than half my life in Taiwan, you know, a little bit, you know, between cultures. I'm a, uh, at this stage of my life, uh, I'm a uh, very passionate cyclist, uh, more for transportation, I would say. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I started a company with, with uh, an amazing team of people. Uh, it's called Turn Bicycles. Uh, we uh, design, manufacture, sell uh, urban transportation vehicles. Um, so that's that's how we think of the bikes that we sell, um, and you know our mission is to get people out of cars for short trips. You know anything under five miles basically can be done a lot better and more enjoyably uh, on a bicycle. And our goal is to design bikes that let people make that switch easily. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love that story too, and and uh, before we hit the record button, we were uh, you know just talking about the fact that yeah we've tread some of the same ground. Uh, I I have my roots there in Los Angeles as well, and I don't know about you, I mean, but having having that connection to LA and experiencing car culture the way that that we both have, it's it's really influenced my approach to life now. And I try to spend as much of my time as possible on a bike and away from a car. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's part of that LA influence. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, I think absolutely. Right. So right. Growing up in LA, it was basically you turn 16, you need your driver's license. That was like mandatory. And if you got a little bit lucky, you had a car as well, right? So, I mean, that was like every 16-year-old kind of, you know, that was like your mission in life was to get a car. Um, you know, and I lived on the west side. Uh, I went to school in North Hollywood. Um, that commute, if you think about it, right, sunset 405 over the hill into the valley and then the 101 across, you couldn't do that commute today. And then I had, you know, sports practice, right? So imagine like you finish practice and you're driving that route home at five in the evening. Literally, you couldn't do that drive. Um, and every time I go back to LA, you know, traffic is worse, right? Yeah. Every single year it's worse. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, yeah, this is, this is so brutal. <laughs> so, I, so I yes, have a is, I have a love hate is, re, I yeah. have a love hate relationship with Southern California and Los Angeles. I mean, fourth generation, so I have deep deep roots there, and you know I've got I've got great 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 grandparents buried there. Um, so it's it's one of those situations where I do miss it, but at the same time, when I'm there, it's so crazy. I I'm like I can't wait to get out of here. But I will say this: it is getting better. 
slowly. It's getting better with the really? with more. Well, yeah, in the sense that what we are seeing is with the build out of the transit system. And uh, and I have noticed that being able to travel uh, to LAX with my travel bike, uh, my folding bike and be able to, you know, get off and, and jump on uh, the metro system and be able to get onto the rail. I can get all the way out to where my family was over in the Glendora area uh, very, very easily and never step foot in an automobile. And that's a huge, huge improvement over uh, what it was like in the 80s when, when you mm. know, I was there in, in college. Mm. So it is getting better. Still a lot mm. of work to be done. And, uh, and, and they are, there are some really good people who are working hard to create more livable communities in that area because they know they've got a problem. But as you and I both know, it's good enough weather. You should be able to ride all year round. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it is, I think, I guess the, the infrastructure has not reached quite, you know, what the places that I, that I'm in. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, you have to start someplace, right? You, you, you don't go from zero to a hundred in one shot. You have to get from zero to 10 to 20 to 30. And, you know, seeing that transit line in Santa Monica, for instance, yeah, that was exciting. My last trip back. Yeah. 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 So that's what I am encouraged by is that it is getting better uh, over time and it needs to get better because it's 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 a mess. It's been a mess. It's been a mess for a while. Uh, But really, the key is, as you were mentioning, this is this is this is the the key thing that we need to be thinking about is, you know, how do we take those steps to integrate bikes into everyday uh, trips and, and, you know, part of your everyday uh, lifestyle. And what I love about the Turn uh, brand and the, the way that you guys have positioned yourself is that these are very comfortable, very functional, um, utilitarian bikes that, you know, people of all ages and abilities uh, can take advantage of and utilize. And it, to me, there's no beautiful, <laughs> more beautiful picture than what we have on screen here right now is, you know, just just a lady with her dog and they're off on a utilitarian trip. I mean, this to me speaks volumes as to what the turn brand is really all about. Yeah. You know, we we think about, you know, what are the barriers to cycling more? Right. And we want to design bikes that that gradually get rid of those different barriers right and you know you know one of them is safety right and that's that comes down to infrastructure and so that's something that you know we have to just you know work with people for bikes and we have to lobby for but there there are a lot of other things like just you're worried about theft right so what kind of locking mechanisms do you have on your bike um you know back to safety you know what kind of lights do you have on the bike you know i i remember you know, this was years ago, but biking with the family would involve 30 minutes of me running around the house looking for bike lights for four bikes. Are they charged? Then I need to look for the locks. Then I need to look for the helmets. And then, and it was really, really like 30 minutes of just running around the house. And so, you know, one of our things is, you know, we should design bikes where the locks, the lights, right, all of the safety equipment, you know, the, the, the trunk, right? The trunk is already on the bike um, and your helmet is in the trunk. And so really when you want to go ride a bike, all you have to do is walk over to your bike, sit on it and ride away without spending all of that time looking for all of the the different stuff. Yeah. And I love this photo, by the way, is, (laughs) is that this is a great photo that really exemplifies the fact that you're selling a complete bike that the, you know, that, that uh, light is already on there. And, uh, and I have a GSD, uh, you know, and so I love the fact that, you know, I also have not only a tail light, but also it's a brake light too. So, cause it actually is actuated so that when I'm squeezing on the blade brake, it actually has that light. So I love the fact that that's one of the things that you all are doing as a brand is to sell bikes that are pretty darn close to complete. I mean, yes, there are some other accessories that you can, you know, 
that you can accessorize with, you know, depending on uh, your cargo carrying desires, uh, whether or not you need a, a seat in the back, et cetera, all those sorts of things. And we can get to that when we get in, dive deeper into cargo carrying capacity. Uh, but I love the fact that you have thought about that because there's nothing more irritating to me than, you know, trying to encourage people to get out and ride. And then they're like excited, they go and they, they go to a bike shop to try to pick up a bike. And it's like, and it's like, it seems like they have to buy all these additional accessories to be able to even ride the bike. And, you know, if you go to a shop in the Netherlands or you go to a shop in, in Denmark or someplace, Sweden, and go in to buy a utilitarian bike, it's got the fenders, it's got the lights, it's got everything that you need to be able to ride. You're not having to, like, add on a whole bunch of extra stuff. So, and a bell, too, by the way, and a bell. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, we are, we are users of the product, right? So uh, we are the customer, and it's pretty easy for us because we go, what do we want? Well, we don't want two battery keys. We want a single battery key that also operates the frame lock. Right. Um, these things cost more money, but if you are a daily user of the product, you just want these conveniences. Um, and in the end, you know, I, I think a lot of people are willing to pay a little bit extra for lots and lots of convenience, comfort, safety, et cetera. Yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned safety, and, and so I, I decided to, let's let's dive into safety a little bit. Um, you know, currently, I, how, how many of your bikes, uh, what, how much of the fleet is actually e-bikes these days? Um, well, a lot of what we sell is electric these days. Okay. Yeah, I mean. Um, it's really the wave yeah, of the future, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think going forward, right, especially if you think about it in terms of transportation uh, with passengers or cargo, electric just eliminates, basically, right, gets rid of a lot of those barriers, right? right. I'm, I'm tired, it's windy, it's hilly, it's a little bit far, right? It gets rid of all of those barriers to cycling. And the reason I wanted to, to, to go to this is because obviously, especially in New York, there's been a lot of talk about uh, e-bike fires and uh, battery uh, issues and all of that. So uh, I, I want to make sure we get to this right away and talk about how important it is um, that if you are going to head down the road of purchasing an e-bike, how important it is to make sure that you're getting a product that that's safe. Um, I, I've had representatives from Bosch uh, on the podcast in the past, and so we've talked about the e-bike uh, systems and all that. But why don't you just pause to take a little bit of time to reflect on the importance of both of these aspects of safety, both the, the battery system and also the frame uh, testing system? Yeah, we look at safety uh, two two big kind of uh, areas. One is the the battery drivetrain system. The other is kind of the frame fork chassis. Battery is incredibly important um, to make sure that that is safe. Uh, because if my math is uh, correct, uh, there there's the power of six hand grenades in a in a four or five hundred watt hour uh, battery pack. So that's a lot of power. And uh, the, the manufacturing process for a battery is, it's not easy, right? You, t you take all these cells, you have to weld them together. Then you take these small bundles and you pack them into a, a, a case. It needs to be protected from water. It needs to be protected from shock. If any of those welds breaks, uh, you have a thermal event, a, a, a fire. So if anything goes wrong, right, in the manufacture of this, this battery pack, you have a, a very, very serious uh, fire danger. And I think working with Bosch lets you have, you know, lets you know that there's a, there is a manufacturer that literally makes hundreds of millions of lithium ion devices per year. Right, all all different kinds, and they have safety standards for for every step. Right, so it's even you know the battery management system, like all of these things. You know the charger, how the charger interacts with the battery. It's incredibly important. And when you when when people want to sell lower cost 
product, right? The way you do that is you cut corners. And when you cut corners, you know, maybe the welding's a little bit different. Maybe the waterproofing's a little bit different. Maybe the case is, you know, like, so there's, there's so many ways you can cut corners. And so when you're getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, that's why, unfortunately, you see a lot of fires in New York City caused by electrical vehicles. I don't want to say all, you know, some are scooters, some are motor, you know, mopeds, and, and some are e-bikes. Unfortunately, it's, it's almost always vehicles that gig workers, right? So these are the, you know, kind of less advantaged people in our society. They have to buy kind of cheap product, and that's where you have problems. So I think, yeah, you, and there have been so many fires now that uh, New York has basically signed into a law, a requirement for e-bikes to be UL2849 certified. Um, we think that certification is important. We agree with it. And I think, you know, the consumer ultimately will get a safer product. You have to have regulation, right? If, you know, if you didn't regulate cars, if you didn't regulate medicine, if you didn't regulate the quality of food, right? Imagine if there's, hey, there's no regulations on the quality of chicken. Like anybody can sell anything, right? We would have a lot of issues. But essentially, e-bikes have been like this. It's been a wild west and everybody charges towards the lower price points. And because, you know, the consumer doesn't realize it, uh, but there have been a lot of safety issues. I'm glad you pointed out to it's not just bikes. It's really it really is all of these uh, electric mobility uh, devices that came out. And uh, we did see early on, you know, a few years ago, uh, even the demise of some le- electric mobility devices that, you know, ended up having a bad reputation for uh, for catching fire. They hoverboards. were banned. Yeah, they were hoverboards. They were banned from from airplanes and and very, very quickly. Uh, you know, that that got tamped down. But I'm so I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Yeah, it's it, it's it's not just uh it's not just e-bikes. It's it's the fact that any of these devices, if they don't have uh, proper testing, proper certification, things could go wrong very quickly. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when they go wrong, they go really wrong because it's not easy to put out a. It's not like you get a fire extinguisher and you just spray it and the fire's out. Like that battery just keeps on going, right? That fire. Um, so the other thing I we think is incredibly important is frame fork chassis uh, testing and and I think this is another area where there effectively now there are no standards um, there there you know there is a there's a Europe has the best standards but even Europe does not have a cargo bike standard for really bikes that are carrying more than 120 kilograms, which is, I think, what is that? 200, is that 260, 264 pounds? So that, and that's rider plus bike plus cargo, right? 264 total uh, gross vehicle weight. So they're, they're, the only standard that exists now is a draft German cargo bike standard which we think is very good. Um, and it basically, uh, you know, the people who drafted it basically said, look, you know, there are more and more cargo bikes coming out now. We need some standards to test uh, the product because, you know, the GSD, the GSD came out. Um, we basically tested it to this draft German cargo bike standard. Right. But it is incredibly severe because we tested the bike to 200 kilograms. And so, it took us, I think, three or four tries to get our fork to pass because we were putting we were putting so much force uh, in the braking test that we were actually bending the rotors, uh, 1.8 millimeter rotors. We were we were bending them before we were reaching full kind of full force pushing on that fork, and and so we made the the fork tubing thicker and thicker and thicker to the point where our supplier just said. Josh, you guys want to go thicker, you might as well just use solid aluminum rods here. I mean, we've never used tubing this thick. And then we we turn around and we we see a lot of cargo bikes in the market 
especially, I would have to say, lower cost ones, where it looks like you've got these skinny little forks uh, that look like they're off, you know, a department store mountain bike, and they are claiming 200 kilograms uh, of capacity. And I think what's happened is that everybody says, hey, there's a GSD, they claim 200 kilograms, hey, we're going to claim the same thing. But I think that testing is so critical because what happens when you're going down a hill, uh, your kid is on the back, you're riding 25 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, and you break and something goes wrong with your fork. Bad things happen. So I feel like, you know, the testing for anybody claiming more than 120 kilograms or 264 uh, pounds, they need to say, hey, what did we test it to? What standard did we test it to? And who did the testing, right? Because traditionally in the bike industry, the person who made the fork or made the frame will say, hey, I have test equipment. I can test it for you. But you know, there's a slight conflict of interest when the company that manufactures that component is also responsible for testing it. So we insist on third-party lab testing. Uh, we use a company called uh, EFBE in Germany. And so, you know, every one of our frames, forks, handle posts, seat posts, they have to get tested third party to the weight. And we use the German cargo bike standard as kind of a minnow, actually. Uh, but I, I think that is so important that people need to realize that uh, there are no mandatory uh, test standards for cargo bikes uh, in the United States. So when somebody claims some weight that's over 300 pounds, you have to ask, what test standard did you test to? Who did the testing? Right? Those two critical questions. You know, and, and I think you can also take a look at the bikes. Right? When you look at a, at a, at a GSD or a, let's say a recent Mueller, right? you can look at the construction of the bikes and you can say, okay, those are pretty sturdy. But if the fork looks like a department store fork, you have to seriously ask yourself, uh, was that actually tested yeah, yeah. to any sort of standard? And, uh, and I brought this photo up because we've, we've got precious cargo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's a reason for wanting to, to go for safety is because we do have, uh, we, we've got precious cargo. When we're talking about trying to get more people riding more often for utilitarian trips, everyday trips, this is what we're talking about. Let's, let's see if we can replace some car trips with bike trips and there's going to be that expectation that we've got a safe and reliable and comfortable ride. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are kind of minimum, right? Minimum requirements right. Right. to get people riding more. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I love the the images that that we have, uh, you know, here because this really starts to normalize what we can do with bikes there. It's no longer this vision that you have to be wearing special clothing, doing special things. You know, you you can just be, you know, doing work, uh, running errands. Uh, I'm not sure if this person's on a shopping trip or what they're doing, but I see a rake in the back and vegetables in the front. <laughs> Maybe they were at the, at their uh, community garden. Good stuff. Yes. Yes. Yeah, well, it's a it's a model, uh, but of yes, uh, that's that's the <laughs> idea is that yeah, you don't have to be dressed you don't have to be dressed in spandex, you know, to to use a bike for transportation. Yeah, 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 absolutely love it. And the the other thing that this really does is I think it opens up and reframes, you know, what we what we think about. We're both you know, LA based, you know, kids, you grew up in car culture. And like you said, you know, at 16, you got to get your driver's license and there's that expectation, you know, if you're going on a date, you know, what it would be like, or guess what? Maybe a date looks like this now. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I had this bike in college, man. Uh, this would have been a fun bike to have in college. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, again, that's the, you know, our, our uh, distribution partner in Italy, um, he was telling us that one time uh, he and his wife uh, went to the opera, you know, and all their friends, you know, arrive in nice high-end cars. Uh, 
uh, and he and his wife got dressed up, but they rode a GSD to the opera, and everybody was, you know, looking at them like, "Oh my God, you're crazy!" Yeah. Um, but you know, he enjoyed it. But, you know, I think, I think this is what you know what what we're trying to do is change behavior, change habits. Um, even you know, there's a there, you know there's a a gym that that I've been going to for you know twenty twenty some years. And it, it, in the past, it was always I would always drive because it's you know you have to cross a couple bridges and you know. Um, but now, with a GSD, it's easy to you know it, it could be by myself, it could be with my wife, it could be with my son. Um, it's it takes almost the exact same amount of time uh, to go by bike as to go by car. And every time I'm in the car now, on that trip, it's like oh god, this this is so bad. Right. Um, but but it's changed a twenty year habit for me that now when I can go to the club uh, and work out, but I get there by bike instead of by car. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned you know dressing up for the opera, but you know also just you know wearing everyday clothing, doing some commutes. Uh, great images here, and and again exemplifying the fact that uh, you you all are building some some bikes that are not necessarily electric, but also just incredibly practical utilitarian tools for everyday life. And in this image, obviously, the you know the model is exemplifying the fact that yeah, we can take transit too. Yeah, absolutely. This is our BYB. It's our most compact folding bike. Yeah, it's a pretty exciting little bike. Yeah. Now is, was, is folding bikes, is that part of the, the DNA of uh, your experience with, with, with bikes and, and with this industry? Yes. So, you know, I got my start at Dahan. Um, that's where a lot of the team uh, came from. So a lot of, you know, we, we have kind of a, a deep love for things folding, um, but also a lot of experience uh, with making things fold. It's not, it, it, things get a lot more complicated when they kind of move in a 3D space. Um, so th- that was kind of our original expertise. But but our, you know, with turn, um, we've always been about urban transportation. So it's not about you know we have an expertise in folding, um, but our interests, you know, are are a lot broader. We're actually interested in, you know, getting people to switch out of cars onto bikes, and so. Folding is one way to do that, right? If you're going to combine a trip with uh, public transport like you do to get to LAX, um, then folding is perfect. Uh, but in some cases, you know, it's it's a five or a ten mile trip, and it could just be electric the whole way, um, right? So there's a lot of different ways or a lot of different types of vehicles, you know, uh, that that you could use. And so our interests are for all of them, actually. Yeah. The other thing that uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged to see, uh, you know, your brand and many other brands doing is starting to really embrace an all ages and abilities sort of ethic and trying to encourage, uh, you know, people of uh, literally of all ages and abilities to be able to, to get out and ride. This particular model, which came out recently, you know, features a, a much lower step over, uh, you know, frame size and really encouraging, uh, I think, people to be able to ride with that electric assist, you know, into their later years. Uh, I, I applaud you guys on this. This is absolutely brilliant. And, and if we have safe infrastructure in our communities, we can get people riding longer into, into their later decades. Yeah. I mean, right. When, if our goal is right to get more people cycling, it can't just be, Hey, you have to be between, you know, five, two and, and six, four, uh, fit, right? It can't just be that because, hey, there's a lot of people shorter than five feet, two inches. Um, there are people with mobility issues. There are people who are less confident on a bike. So we actually had a prototype of this this bike and uh, we had a, fr- a friend's wife. Um, we were trying to convince her to go on a on a three-day bike tour. And and so we said, hey, uh, you're, but she's, she's afraid of biking. First of all, she's a little bit petite. Uh, so she's shorter than five feet, I believe. And she's afraid of cars and traffic. And so she was very unsure of her self cycling. And so we got her on this bike and she took off and all of a sudden she was like, 
oh my God. And she circled back around and she was like, I feel so comfortable on this bike. How come I've never felt like this on a bike before? Right. And, and, you know, she's sub five foot. And the reality is if you're shorter than five feet, you walk into a bike shop, there aren't a lot of bikes that, that fit you very well. So, you know, I think, again, this is how we think about getting people onto bikes is you have to, you have to appeal to the, the edges, right? Whether it's in physical ability or physical height or age. And so we were, this is, this bike is called the NBD uh, and it stands for new bike day because right, the, everybody who gets a new bike, you experience this burst of joy. Um, and our goal is, you know, for even if you're a little bit older uh, or you haven't ridden a bike in a while, or you're a little bit afraid that you can experience that same joy that, right, that you and I have every time we get a new bike. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I love it. And, and I think it's so incredibly important. And I talk about this a lot on the Active Towns uh, channel is that we should be transforming our built environment into all ages and abilities facilities. And this matches quite well with that of being able to say, oh, and by the way, increasingly, we've got some options that are, you know, quite friendly to people who may be a little less confident out on their bike, or maybe, you know, they're, they've aged out of that typical bike riding scenario and situation. And they're like, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm in my eighties now. And I, I kind of feel like I need to be a little closer to the ground and, and, you know, and a little bit more comfortable. So I really ap uh, applaud that. I mean, I think it's really visionary because when we think about the, our aging population, uh, it's just really, you know, quite beautiful. Yeah. I think the other thing that we are trying to do is to, you know, have diversity in models, right? We, we you know, your, your typical, right. Your typical bike ad, uh, you know, there's a guy skidding on a trail, there's dirt flying up. It's a guy, right? Usually it's a guy. Yeah, it's a guy. Um, and <laughs> it's, so it's a dude. <laughs> yeah. We, we, you know, so we, we really make a point of having diversity in models, diversity in situations, you know, body types, ages. Um, yeah. Because I think that's important, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it has to be a reflection of, the communities, the environments that we're in. And so images like this, I think are really, really powerful. Uh, and, and it helps to speak to the fact that yes, what we're talking about here is trying to, uh, get more butts on bikes. <laughs> and, and if we are able to appeal, appeal to a broader audience, uh, it, that helps a, a great deal. Yeah, absolutely. So the other thing that, that I wanted to make sure that we talked upon and we, we, we briefly uh, brushed over it during the, our discussions about the uh, uh, really about the safety and the, and the technology and the framing, but is really about this opportunity that we have to try to um, shift more motor vehicle trips uh, over to uh, bikes. And specifically, I'm thinking about uh, utilitarian bike logistics and being able to leverage, uh, you know, this, the cargo carrying capacity. And I can't remember if it was in on your website here or in another location, but it really drove home the fact that a well-built cargo bike can carry up to like 5x the amount of weight of what you know the weight of the vehicle whereas a delivery van is only like 0.8 times the you know their their cargo carrying capacity i mean that's efficiency of resources of materials to be able to build said vehicle yeah i mean if you look at uh I mean, you, you could look at an electric cargo bike right the GSD is one example, but the electric cargo bike is really the most efficient way to get cargo from point A to point B. And you can look at that in terms of, you know, cost per mile, uh, cost per kilowatt. I mean, you can look at it in a, a whole range of things, but it is on every single one of those ranges, it is the most efficient way to move stuff. Um, it's the most efficient in terms of, like you said, the use of Earth's resources. But even 
you know, in, in crowded urban cities, you can actually do more deliveries per hour. So if you're a company and, and you don't care about your carbon footprint, although I'd have to say that most people now are beginning to care, um, but even if, even if you didn't care about your carbon footprint and you just do it for pure economics, you can actually do more deliveries per hour. Your cost of labor is a little bit lower because you don't have to have a person with insurance driving a truck. Your maintenance costs are lower. Your storage costs are lower. So like all, there are so many benefits just from pure economics. Um, and that's something that you know we, we want people to realize is that it makes sense. And so you know one of our projects uh, is with Whole Foods, uh, Amazon in, in New York. And so it, if you order delivery for anything from Whole Foods, chances are very good that it gets delivered to you by a turn bicycle pulling a trailer and that's in Manhattan. And it and it just, it makes so much sense, right? You get trucks off the road, you improve air quality, you reduce noise pollution. I think there are, I think the number I recall was something like there's like 100,000 delivery vans in the New York area. Imagine if you could, you know, slowly 5%, 10% convert those to electric cargo bikes like this. Yeah. Well, you, you just mentioned the trailer. So, you know, here, here's, here's the, the GSD, um, you know, pulling, um, uh, the trailer. What's the trailer's name again? It's a uh, Carla cargo. It's made in That's Germany. Right. Uh, it's, it is the yeah best in class trailer. It's a workhorse. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, I'm, I'm within easy biking distance of, uh, uh, HQ for, for whole foods. So, I would love to see that, you know, happening here as it is right now. My groceries are delivered by GSD because I just ride my GSD there. It's like a two mile ride. So it's easy to get there. And I have the luxury of an all ages and abilities facility, uh, essentially from my doorstep, you know, to the, the, the grocery store and back. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm privileged in being able to live in a, in a city that is really working hard to build out that infrastructure. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the bike industry role in trying to encourage, uh, you know, cities to be able to adopt policies, to be able to build out uh, the infrastructure, but also be able to, to, you know, kind of take advantage of, of this type of commercial delivery. Because one of the things that I think about is policies that cities can implement to be able to say, to incentivize or encourage, uh, you know, more delivery companies and more delivery uh, situations to take place via last mile situations with cargo bikes versus trying to shove massive, you know, vehicles into our, you know, downtown congested, you know, areas and frequently blocking our protected bike lanes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the, the, I am a believer in economics driving human behavior. Um, and so, you know, I think incentives are great, right? We'll take them, right? You know, uh, electric, you know, if I want to go buy a, a Tesla from Elon Musk, I can get an incentive for doing that we should have incentives for, for e-bikes, right? But but the reality is, I, I think if cities could just focus on infrastructure, make cycling safe, give us separated bike lanes, right? I think then companies acting selfishly will naturally gravitate towards the type of vehicle that is cheaper to operate, that does more deliveries per hour. I mean, Right, they will just naturally go in the direction if you can build that infrastructure. So, you know, for me, I really think you know in, incentives are nice, and but they're kind of the, the the cherry on top. But the thing that we really need from cities is just give us infrastructure where a mom or a kid can you know like where you or I you know our kids could ride to school and that we could go. Okay, you can go yourself because I know the entire route is a separated bike lane. Um, but in many cities, it's not like that. And so you wouldn't let your kid ride to school by themselves. You'd have to ride, you know, with them. Um, 
So I, I, I would, you know, I, I, we put our focus really on just infrastructure, 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 because then everybody else will act selfishly uh, and people will ride more. Yeah. Well, and I think it's important to, to, to point out too, especially when we look at say, you know, this, this, uh, the, the GSD and, or the, the HSD and, and seeing some of the, the, you know, cargo carrying capacity that we end up having here in the, the wider footprint. It's also good to point out to, to cities that you, when you are building your, all ages and abilities protected and separated cycle infrastructure network, as you should be, think about the size of it too, because we're going to start seeing even more pressure on that space if we're running some of our, uh, you know, our cargo bikes on there. And so we're already seeing that happening in some countries like in the Netherlands where they're changing their standards and saying, you know what, we need even wider cycle paths because uh, we're running out of space, especially when we see everything from you know, the daily mail <laughs> being delivered, uh, you know, by, by cargo bike, uh, as well as our Amazon packages. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, you know, bike infrastructure is so cheap relative to anything else, right? It's so cheap, like per, per mile, it's so cheap to build a bike lane, you know, but, but, you know, you know, you're, you're right with, uh, with cargo bikes, you know, Another project that we are, it's not actually a project, it's we are supplying uh, GSDs to New Zealand Post. So we have a, there's a fleet of about 200 GSDs running around New Zealand delivering post. Uh, and that fleet, uh, so that initial you know, 250 bikes, the, the, the reaction from uh, mail carriers has been very positive. So they're expanding the fleet. But I, I think businesses are gradually coming to realize that, hey, e-cargo bikes make sense uh, and we should use more of them. Uh, it's, it, it's slow um, and we need cities to, to help with the infrastructure, but it just makes so much sense from so many different angles. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, with the, the, the New Zealand post uh, and especially given the fact that we just recently here in the United States put in a fresh new order for for new um, mail carrying capacity, the, the 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 Jeeps or whatever they're they're driving these days now. And they they ended up putting in a massive order for gas guzzling vehicles. And I'm like, no. Eventually, that that order got stopped and changed a little bit to encourage some more electric uh, postal carrier vans, et cetera. But I'm like, please, you know, what do we have to do to be able to recognize that, you know, we can equip you know, the, the, these, these types of bikes with the, the proper carrying capacity to be able to do those sorts of deliveries. And it's not this is not earth shattering. I mean, I, it's, it's, we're seeing more of it now, but I mean, it's been, the mail has been delivered by bicycle for literally decades in countries like Sweden and Denmark and, and other locations. Mm. Yeah. You, you look at a, you know, what, what your typical, at least in my neighborhood, the typical mail truck is, you know, it's, it's, it's double parked, it's blocking some traffic, right. And it's, and it's moving, you know, 20 yards at a time down the street, the picture of inefficiency, basically. I mean, wouldn't you have much more efficient you know, mail delivery if you had a big truck driving to maybe uh, a, a central location and then five e-cargo bikes coming up? So it's really kind of a hub and spoke model. And then each of those cargo bikes go down a different street. You know, I, I'm betting uh, that you know, you would do way more deliveries per hour using that model and uh, your your costs would go down. Yeah, it sounds like that's uh, you, there's also some fleet management types of services and software that you all are helping provide to some of your turn business uh, bike customers of being able to, you know, be able to manage their fleet of their delivery uh, bikes as well. Yeah, this is, so for us, this is a little bit early days. Um, you know, it starts with, you know, an IOT box where you can track, you know, track the vehicle, speed, yeah. location, you know, all of those things. And then now once you have that data, you can then start to 
right? You can calculate stops per hour and, you know, optimize routes, those sorts of things. Yeah. Josh, is there anything that we haven't yet covered that you really want to share with the, uh, the audience here today? Uh, I I can't think of anything offhand, uh, just because I'm, I'm talking and thinking bikes all day, every day. (laughs) Um, but, uh, you know, I, I look, I, I think, you know, very simply, I, and I've seen this in my own life, I, what I would say is, you know, for, for trips that are shorter than, start easy, right? Shorter than three miles, five kilometers. Think about uh, doing that on a bike instead of in a car um, and see how it feels. See how, you know, do you enjoy it more? Is it faster? Are you getting a bit of a workout? You know, like, like tonight, for example, I... You know, my, my commute to work is about 10 kilometers, um, but it's a great way to get a workout in without have, actually having to s- separately set out time to do a workout. So uh, I, I think, you know, for, for anybody out there, it's just like, look, if you have a trip that's only three miles, try it on a bike and, and see how, how it makes you feel. Because, uh, it, you know, in a lot of cases, you're going to say, well, it took a, about the same amount of time. I got a little bit of a workout in and it was kind of fun. And especially things like the school drop off, right? Where you are sitting in a traffic jam for 10 or 15 minutes to drop your kid off. And on a bike, if you had had a cargo bike, you could actually just zoom right up to the front of the school and then be off to your next uh, errand. Uh, You could probably actually save time. So uh, start small, start with easy trips, um, but try it out. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. And I went to this photo to, to, to close this out just because, well, there's a puppy in it. So that works. <laughs> and and, it, and it, also, it, it also sort of exemplifies the fact that, yeah, grab a friend. Take a friend along with you uh, as you're trying to add uh, some of those uh, additional rides to your life. And do what you can in your neighborhood uh, to talk with your neighbors, um, get together as a community, uh, really start making it known uh, that this is something that is important to you so that your elected representatives know that, you know, it is important that we have safer places to ride, safe routes to school. You just mentioned, you know, taking the kids to school, having a a safer drop-off situation by schools. You know, a school zone should not be a place that is, you know, chock full of motor vehicles. It should be a place where kids can be able to walk and bike to be able to access their schools. So speak up, let your let your rep, elected representatives know. And, uh, and again, Josh, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been an absolute joy and honor. Thank you, John. It's been great. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Josh Hahn from Turn Bicycles. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with a friend that you think might get inspired to ride a little bit more frequently for some everyday activities. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below. Ring that notifications bell so that you can customize your notification preferences. And I'll be back real soon with another episode. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>